Hello and welcome back. Um, I want first to apologize for having taken so long and getting to a video on John Dowie. I know I had promised one to follow rather soon and I've just had a lot of changes in life since it have made it difficult. Um, but in addition to that, my direction where I wanted to go on this keep has changed more than once. Um, so I have a, there's such a wealth of information on this guy and the con artist that he was. And it's been a little difficult to be sure which direction I should take with this. Um, finally, I determined the longer I research, the longer I beat around the bush, the more I'm going to change directions, change directions, and I'm never going to get a video out. So, this is kind of winged it. I've got lots and lots of notes on this guy, but um, they're a little disorganized because of my continual changing direction. Um, but before we start today, I want to go through a list of the names of some of the victims who suffered at his hands. So that th this can kind of be in their memory. Uh, this isn't a complete list by any means. This is probably I combed through about three or 4,000 articles and these are the names I got so far. There's thousands upon thousands more articles um but so this is in memory of millie logan cf newell wf green ira l peck anita flanders albert garbett the infant of a a walker paul Steele valiva four years old the son of Dowie's second in command, Mary Dowie Stevenson, buried at sea, Charles Mosher, Harold Mosher, Raymond Dowie Thomas, two years old, Mabel Ray, two years old, Agnes Kinberg, 11 years old, Emma Lowe Judd, uh, the infant Mary Louisa Christensen, or infant of Mary, Mary Louisa Christensen and Earl Gladstone Pearson, two months old, and Thomas Steele. And also to all those whose names I don't have readily available right now. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start moving into this. Uh, let me see. I'm sorry if it's a little more disorganized than usual, but as I was explaining, my direction on this has changed more than once. Um, so we're going to start with some notes, or I guess it was the book that I was telling y'all that I was working on at one point, and I'm just going to read some parts of that. Now there's way too much to cover in a video, um, but we're going to start with that because I feel like that is a good place to start. Um, give me a moment. Picking up, uh, one of the areas I want to cover is what I call the unholy trinity that impacted Dowling. This was a group of faith healers in the United States that predated, predated Dowie's arrival here, but who influenced him. Uh, and that it's going to include William Edwin Boardman, Albert Benjamin Simpson, and Sarah Mix. Uh, the first three, Mix, Boardman, and Simpson, they were all disciples of, of, of two faith healers, uh, one named Ethan Allen Otis, and another, Dr. Charles Collis. Uh, in a Lawrenceburg, Kentucky article published in 1902, speaking of Dowie, says, Chicago World's Fair. 
He pitched his tent near the entrance of the world's fairgrounds, and like Boardman Simpson and Mrs. Mix, who he followed, attracted more than ordinary attention as a faith curer and healer. Dowie possessed more shrewdness than the average talker of his class that may be found talking nightly on State and Monroe Streets in Chicago. And from the hut, as his tent was called, he entered the music hall, and finally the great auditorium with a seating capacity of thousands. With his knowledge of ministerial work, Dowie soon had many ministers with him, and later well-organized bands of workers were going here and there receiving contributions and converts for him. Money was soon plentiful, and a large tabernacle was built. Now, it should be noted that here, uh, Dowie didn't follow these people literally like around the World's Fair. Only Albert Simpson of the three were still alive in 1893. Uh, he, Albert Simpson, was busy giving lectures at the Moody Bible Institute a few miles away during the fair. When this article states that he followed these three. It's informing the reader that Dowie followed their teachings. He was, he had similar teachings as them. He was always a charlatan, even before he began following them. As a young man, he lived in Australia, which at the time was the location of several penal colonies. But he was not, don't get me wrong, he was not in the penal colonies. His father and mother immigrated there after his uncle, who was very wealthy in manufacturing there in Australia. Um, and they followed him there. His, uh, his church in Australia, one of them, <laughs> he had many uh, that he was chased out of, one of them conveniently burned down, allowing him to pay off a great deal of debts. In his own words, Dowie stated he was a faith healer already during this time, his time in Australia. Uh, the Western Kansas World reported in December 1903, quote, he declares that he first learned of his power to heal by curing a girl of wasting disease that had already killed 30 members of his congregation, end quote. But as we learn more about this man, I'm not so certain that it wasn't Dowie himself that killed the 30 members of his congregation. Or at the very least, he had a hand in it by convincing these 30 sick people that they had been healed by God's hand, getting them to forego any necessary treatment. And thus, we only have Dowie's account that these people even existed at all, because they either were dead or never existed. Um... When I learned of his claim regarding the 30 members of his congregation who died of this wasting disease, I found it peculiar the timing of his revelation in regards to his healing abilities. Um, also, because there's no wasting disease reported at the time in Australia, but had he only known 30 people earlier, perhaps no one in his congregation would have died, right? It seems odd to me that a man who God would give such power, as he claimed, for the purpose of healing would only be given that power after 30 people died in front of his face. Either Dowie was lying or was God running late that day? Uh, I, I go for Dowie was lying. Uh, it appears to be false, and we'll discuss it some more at some point. But other than Dowie's contact with... Uh, a faith healing spiritualist and the probability that he read the works by Boardman, Simpson, and Mix, there is no evidence whatsoever to support this claim of Dowie's other than Dowie repeating it. For the sake of brevity, um, in, in what was going to be this book, I, I laid out the histories of Simpson and Mix and these other people influential but we're going to skip over that for a bit and, and the doctrines that they brought to the forefront that had never been a part of the church um and we're doing that because it just it would be and we could go on for days discussing some of this stuff so i'm going to skip forward I do i do though want to say real quick um alfred b simpson uh, one of the ones that was mentioned. 
He was uh, credited with writing hundreds of books, leading huge revivals with thousands in attendance. He promoted faith healing and so-called spiritual gifts such as speaking in tongues. Simpson saw Dr. Collis perform his healing mystery, ministry in Old Orchard Beach, Maine, a location he would go on to hold his own ministries at. Charismatic members today paint him as a man who had an unyielding love for the broken and impoverished immigrants, claiming he felt the need to teach healing due to a revelation he received from God. At one point, Simpson, with Boardman and Dowie, prayed and attempted to, fit, uh, to faith heal their friend Russell Kelso Carter. It failed grievously and would eventually lead to the end of the friendship when Carter recanted the idea that divine healing was available to those who had faith through the atonement on the cross and espoused that one is healed or not based on God's will alone. Carter published a book about this. Um, I, I don't remember the title offhand. I, I actually borrowed a copy of it from a library once. I believe it was like Faith Healing Reviewed 20 years later or something to that effect. Um, but Simpson wasn't particularly known for his faith healing doctrines or speaking in tongues. But uh, I don't. I, like I said, I don't want to get too much into Simpson and them right now. This video is meant to be about Dowie. Right, well, Dowie was already a con artist in Australia, um, already getting fights with police and the press. Um, he eventually moved. He immigrated, basically almost was banished from Australia, and he moved to Los Angeles. Um, there he got involved in securities fraud and he sold some fake securities to two women who sued him in Los Angeles. Um, I believe this was about, I believe it was 1890 or 1891. And about that time too, papers all over the country started advertising the World's Fair that was gonna be held in Chicago in 1893. And Dowie left Los Angeles and went to Chicago. How much of that was escaping the punishment of ripping these women off, I don't know. Um, but he arrives in Chicago. And he sets up outside the World's Fair. Actually, he starts setting up before the World's Fair starts. And this is really the turning point for Dowie because, um, hold on one moment. Buffalo Bill, he was at the World's Fair. He was most likely the most famous person in America at the time. And as I said in the intro to this video, the previous video, uh, two thirds of all of, was it two thirds or a third? third of all Americans attended the World's Fair, like over 20 million people. Um, and Buffalo Bill was set up outside the fair, right at the entrance. Um, and it was Dowie's claim to heal Buffalo Bill's niece, Sadie Cody, by she, she apparently suffered a long time with having one leg slightly shorter than the other. And he healed her and grew her one leg so it would be long as the other leg. And everybody fell for this con. It's actually an old parlor trick that predates the intermingling with this faith healing nonsense into Christian denominations. But Dowie did it and by the way, there's no evidence that I can find that Buffalo Bill actually had a niece named Sadie Cody. There was a court document. Dowie was sued in court. And allegedly, Sadie Cody wrote to the court testifying of the fact that she was healed, but didn't actually appear. And I, I believe that this Sadie Co Cody was a plant. Um... 
I, I've gone into genealogy research, trying to find evidence of this girl's existence, and there's nothing. The the brother of Buffalo Bill that she claims to be the daughter of doesn't exist. Uh, so that that's another troubling. Back in the day, I guess you could just forge letters and send them into the courts to as part of your defense. Dow Dowie's uh, fame rivaled and actually at some point superseded that of Mariah Woodward Eder, who I discussed in previous videos. Um, his charlatan practices harmed many people just as hers did and divided Christians as they'd never been divided before. In the previous chapters, I gave you the background of the World's Fair, and again, this is because it was a book. In the previous video, the introduction, I gave you the background of the World's Fair because as you'll learn in this video, it really was the platform out of which the new apostolic and charismatic Pentecostal churches, Zionist churches in South Africa, that IHOP, uh, Bill Johnson's School of Supernatural Ministry, they'd all spread forth from this. And a great portion of our study will focus on Dowie's activities in 1893 in Chicago. Uh, In preparing this, I stumbled upon a paper called The Big Con, John Alexander Dowie and the Spread of Zionist Christianity in South Africa by Barry Morton, who was a research assistant and still probably one of the absolute, absolute best Dowie historians <laughs> that there is. Um, but I, it includes what is perhaps the most extensive biography I've ever come across about John Alexander. And one I highly recommend to all who are interested in this in any way. However, his focus is the spread of Zionist churches in South Africa, while my focus is to help you understand these charismatic churches and that they still exist to this day and where they came from, how they're a continuation of the con that was set in motion by this group of faith healers. Um, and I want to point out that they're, it's, they're, their spiritual and ministerial descent comes from the spiritualists and necromancers of, born out of the spiritualist movement. Um, John Alexander Dowie, he was born in St. Andrew's Parish in Edinburgh, Scotland, on 25th of May, 1847. He spent his first 13 years there before they relocated to Adelaide, South Australia. But then at the age of 25, he returned to Edinburgh, where he studied at the University of Edinburgh. Once he graduated, he went back to Australia. But... He had an uncle in Edinburgh named George Dowie. George Dowie denied the existence of the devil and of hell and held strange doctrines concerning prophecy, which Dowie seemed to embrace. Now, how influential his uncle was on him, I don't know, but I guess it should be pointed out there's, if you're in Scotland, there's a difference when they refer to a Dowieite, they're talking about the followers of George Dowie, whereas the rest of the world are talking about charismatics, Dowieism, Dowie, Dowieite, they're all terms re relating to John Alexander Dowie. They're used derogatory towards uh, the greater charismatic movement. Um, anyway, so Dowie moves back to Australia, and in 1876, he married his cousin, Jane, who ironically was the sister of a John Alexander Dowie. Um, she was born in South Australia, and of course, Dowie's uncle was pissed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if he eventually got over it. Some people claim he did, but I, I don't think so. At the time of his marriage, he was already a pastor at a 
at churches in Alma, in Hamley Bridge, then Manly, then New South Wales, Newtown, uh, like everywhere he went, he got chased out of their churches. Um, and that's, a lot of this is before he started teaching this uh, new prophecy, neo Montanism and faith healing antics that he would later adopt. But they were already, he was part of the temperance movement. And a lot of people were angry with him all the time. Uh, his early life appears to be one in which he followed his father around quite a bit, active in the same abstinence and sporting organization. Now, when it says abstinence there, it's talking about abstinence from alcohol and sporting organizations that his father was a part of. At Edinburgh, he, Edinburgh, he studied theology Yet there's no evidence of him being familiar with faith healing as a concept until years later. I contend that this is because it was still relatively a new movement. In the United Kingdom, only Elizabeth Baxter and a few of her associate, associates had started practicing it. Uh, a year after his marriage, at 30 years old, he publishes his first book entitled Rome's Polluted Springs, which despite being a symbolic name held more than a bucket full of truth, um, but we're not here to discuss that right now. <laughs> That's a whole nother topic. Uh, this book would be followed in two years in 1879 by a book called The Drama, the Press, and the Pulpit. Both in the sense that this was the title of one of his books and that from that point on through the rest of his life, he would create drama between the press and the pulpit. Earlier we examined, uh, no we didn't, we skipped that. <laughs> Let's see, okay, so in addition to the three people I mentioned before, Mix, uh, Simpson, and oh, Mick, it was Mix, Albert Simpson, anyway. The three influences on Dowie I mentioned before. There was another, um, a larger influence perhaps, though not a Christian one. It was a man named Thomas Walker. He, Dowie met him by 1879 or 1880. They would eventually have a falling out and there's, you, you can come through the archives in Australia and there they were tied up in the courts going at each other for quite a while. Um, but Dowie was in Melbourne when he became involved with Thomas Walker, the spiritualist, who Thomas Walker had previously been a child preacher in a Wesleyan church, but he gave that up to practice spiritualism. Uh, he worked as a necromancer in Toronto and Ontario, where he performed seances for his customers, allegedly contacting the dead on their behalf. Uh, now, we all know the Bible says, you know, it condemns, I, I, my Bible's over there in the bookcase, but it condemns necromancy, where he uh, allegedly contacted him dead on their behalf. During one of his seances, Walker burned himself with phosphorus, which was used to create illuminating writings. His customer, who helped put out the fire, was burned and died within weeks. Walker fled the country and stayed away for two years before returning and studying under Dr. James Peeble, who was a famed spiritualist healer, heading the National Spiritualist Association and many other organizations. Walker was sent to Australia by Peebles, arriving in March of 1877. Now, this is important because later, after Dowie's ministry grows in Chicago. His Leaves of Healing publication actually commends Dr. James Peebles for his stance on uh, abstinence from alcohol or, and other things and tobacco. And uh, then several spiritualist publications of the time Actually, they commend Dowie a great deal. They know who Dowie is. Dowie knows what he's doing, how he's mixing spiritualism with Christianity. 
They call him that great man of Chicago. This is the name the spiritualists give him in their writings. That great man of Chicago. Why, why did they consider him great? Well, he was intermingling these formerly, these practices formerly recognized as witchcraft into Christianity. Um, academics who study the history of the charismatic movement and Dowie in particularly, and Dowie in particular, they tend to believe that Dowie was the mastermind, bringing many things he studied together, but they don't give any credit to people or Peebles or Walker for having inspired Dowie. I don't doubt Dowie's ability to make things that were previously disconnected appear to have a connection. I believe Peebles and Walker deserve more credit though, and they were the real, real inspirations to Dowie. That they were the inspiration that gave Dowie the ideas for his developments. Just shortly after meeting Walker in Australia, Dowie leaves his church um, and opens up in a theater where he starts practicing faith healings. If you want to know about uh, that, when Dowie praised Peebles in uh, his publication, Leaves of Healing, that's going to be volume 35, just in case y'all want to look it up yourselves. Um, and, what, and what could hardly be a coincidence, Dowie left his church in 1879, became an independent evangelist. Now, he'd always been affiliated with Congregationalist Church. Now he just leaves. Begins to hold meetings in a theater and claiming powers as a faith healer. By 1882, he was invited to another church, the Saxville Street Tabernacle, Collingwood. Collingwood. This new position would not last. Uh, one, that's the church where the bomb went off, like right by his office. Uh, to be honest with Dowie's history of trying to play a martyr to rent, to lure in new recruits, I wouldn't be surprised if he said it all. The, the claim that is most often made is that Dowie's author, authoritarian leadership led to a split in the church. But while Dowie most certainly had been known for authoritarian leadership, it's very likely that his new focus on healing rather than the gospel was equally responsible. Either way, by February of 1883, some of the church members that split away from Dowie locked themselves in a building that the two groups were contending over, and the Dowie loyalists began marching against them. Dowie was arrested for leading an unauthorized procession through the streets and spent several months in jail. Confirming his authoritarian style, his next book was about these incidents and its title, Accusatory in Nature, Sin in the Camp. Whenever someone disagreed with Dowie, he proclaimed them a sinner. This would not change during his lifetime. His own sins, he never acknowledged, at least not publicly. In 1888, his church burned down. Under very, This is the same church that there was already a bomb set off previously in, allegedly, to try and kill him. It burned down under suspicious circumstances, which allowed him to pay off huge debts which he had incurred in Australia, and he was kind of banished and left. And earlier I said Los Angeles. I apologize for that. That was a mistake. Um, I've been to Los Angeles, but I, I get it confused sometimes. It was actually San Francisco where Dowie uh, set up when he came to the United States and where he ripped off those two women with the fake securities. In San Francisco, he set up an organization he named the International Divine Healing Association. He sold memberships. Over 900 were sold in his first few days in California. And as long as its members paid their dues, Dowie would pray for them. As a, one reporter informed of Dowie's practice in regard to prayer requests, he couldn't even be entrusted to that. Reported by a reporter in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, he who witnessed how they do it, he says Dowie goes to what he calls his clock praying machine and presses a button 
and out drops a card which reads, you are prayed for at 2.35 p.m., which is, it, which is at once sent to the sender of the money. General prayers, which are calculated to restore health, are talked by him into a phonograph, and the records are then sold for a good price to his followers. The great number of followers that Dowie obtained in such a short time were actually good for his business and the distance he usually kept from most shows that he was already well aware of the fact that the closer he was to his followers, the less likely they would be convinced. Morton, uh, who I told you wrote, is one of the best Dowie scholars, wrote in his paper, Only prof professing Christians who believed in the possibility of divine healing were allowed to see Dowie. The whole process weeded out those most likely to mentally submit to the process, as well as those suggestible to it. Belief in the authority of the, the authority of the healer or the healing process is indispensable for psychosomatic cure, the psychosomatic cure. It cannot be relied on for long. As the patient gets to know the doctor better, the power of suggestion decreases. Thus, over time, familiarity breeds contempt. This is why faith healers or others who rely on the placebo effect are typically itinerant or else remain completely aloof from their followers. Hence, Dowie's ability to conduct faith healings decreased by 1890. Dowie must have been painfully aware of this information. We are actively able to see that Dowie had no intention of bringing any of his followers in close to him at the time. Through an article published in Los Angeles Daily Herald in 1889. After, Mr. Dowie and his wife departed for San Diego. That's after a service. A society was formed calling itself the Los Angeles branch of the American Divine Healing Association. That's why I was confused on Los Angeles earlier. It has been in existence only about 10 days, its first regular meeting being held last Monday evening, but its membership is nearly 900. These are people from all the Orthodox churches in the city, scarcely a single religious organization that is not represented in the society. This was actually a genius thing Dowie did, both in Chicago, everywhere he went. He allowed people from all different denominations to come pick up his doctrines and bring them back into their churches. Um, that's part of his uh, plan. You know, at one point, Dowie said, I want to say right here that the purpose of Zion, his town he founded, is to smash every church now in existence. And that he went about do trying to do. And to this day, many, many churches have adopted his doctrines. The doctrines of the new organization were explained to a representative of this paper. It must not be supposed that this has any connection with the mind cure or of Christian science, as it is called, nor is it the same as what is generally called the faith cure. The scripture narrates the works performed by the Savior in healing the bodies of men, and instances are given of where he bestows the same power on others. The early history of the church tells of a number of cures which were performed by the elders and teachers. The power seems to have remained among the adherents of the faith for several centuries, up to the time when evil crept into the church and the purity of the original faith was debased. That is a problem. That is where Sally starts claiming he's restoring a church like the Mormons do or the Jehovah's Witness and that Christian church is left the faith and is the base. And they're the great restorers. He actually called himself Elijah the Restorer. Um, but not until modern times, when the early purity of the faith came to be restored, have there been many instances of the use of this power. Now, see, Dowie claims to have restored this. Of course, modern charismatics say it didn't happen until 1906. Azusa Street. Um, but no, it goes back. It, it, this Everything that the early Charismatics did contradicts the history that the Charismatics will give you now. And there's reasons for it, but we're not getting into that yet. Have the, 
All right, but not until modern times, when the early purity of the faith came to be restored, have there been many instances of the use of this power. It appears that it is not the intention to form an organization which shall interfere in any way with the doctrines of the established churches, but rather in a way to supplement their teachings. Except for, as we already know, Dowie says that one of his goals is to smash every church now in existence. If we observe closely, we can see through the words in this article that Dowie did not intend to stay after this convention, but was already departing the city, thus keeping his distance from those who believed they were miraculously healed, and ensuring that his power of suggestion would remain intact. This article goes on to tell us even more, however, claiming Dowie's organization does not intend to interfere with the doctrines of established orthodoxy, and third, that the members of nearly every church in Los Angeles were present. Thus, not having left their churches, they do not follow him closely, but rather they merely carried his doctrines back to their home church bodies. On a separate note, we should also consider his claim that in the early church, the elders and teachers did have the ability to heal. And yet Dowie, while certainly appearing the part of an elder with his big white beard, had separated himself from every church with whom he disagreed, many times because they pushed him out involuntarily. Dowie himself was thus not an elder of any church, and by his own admission, his organization, ADHA, was not a church. Despite his lack of church status, Dowie was able to and did infiltrate the churches of the Orthodox denominations with a new doctrine, even while claiming non-interference as he told the parishioners that their churches were churches in which evil, cre quote, evil crept in and the purity of the original faith had been debased, end quote. Even if Dowie couldn't change the minds of the ministers, many of the parishioners were susceptible. But Dowie's phony faith healings were not the only con he was actively running during his time in California. Now, this is what I told you about a little earlier. In fact, he wound up in court after purchasing bankrupt companies and selling them to his constituents. Two women successfully sued him there for this practice, and it became a public relations nightmare for his organization. Once again, what's Dowie do? He skips town. In 1890, at 43 years old, he relocates to Chicago. And it, was, it wasn't an accident he wound up there. Uh, in California alone, there were over 2,000 separate articles about the coming World Fair that were published. He knew what was coming. He went to Chicago because it was the, basically the land of opportunity at the time. It was the place people from all over the world would come. Um, you know, it, it didn't matter if you were there to set up a Wild West show or become a serial killer or, in Dowie's case, a heretic. But all of that would be there. Between 1890 and 1893, he remained largely unsuccessful, and very few people were interested in him. Um, this religion, let's read a article. Yeah, so um, give me just another moment, and I'll be right back with you. Actually, a wonderful thing. Um, I did not remember having actually recorded this down, but it, it's allegedly, this is, so this is the letter that Sadie Cody, the non-existent Sadie Cody, um, sent to the court regarding her healing by Dowie. Let's look at, in her words, Sadie Cody's testimony, stenographically reported. I have touched the hem of his garment, and I stand before you free. A year ago, last September, I was taken sick at the World's Fair. Nine months ago, I became perfectly helpless. I was attended by four physicians and my uncle, Dr. David, brother to Buffalo Bill, an eminent physician in this city. They decided that nothing could be done except to put me in a plaster of Paris cast. Five of my vertebrae were worse than useless, 
and an abscess as large as my first was at the base of my spine. A large swelling was developing into a tumor. My limb was three inches short. That she means shorter than the other. And in that condition, I was brought to Chicago. The day that they were to put the cast on me, one of the physicians was called away by a telegram, a providential inter interruption. That same day, a copy of Leaves of Healing fell upon my bed. I was brought to Chicago, and Dr. Dowie prayed for me. After, he laid hands on me in the name of the Lord. There commenced a great struggle, as if something inside of me that held my breath were tearing itself away. It seemed to me as if I went to sleep, but immediately almost I awoken, and what a blessed awakening. I felt new life in me. There was no pain and no aching. Aching. I had really awoken to health. From that moment, I have been rapidly improving, and now I stand before you. I stand before you, but she's not standing before you. She sent this in a letter. With both limbs of equal length, my spine, which could not be touched with the finger, without me fainting, can now be rubbed as hard as anyone can rub it. The swelling from the abscess and the tumor are gone. I cannot find words to praise the Lord for what he has done for me. I will give him my life service, but that is small compared to what he has done. I consider Dr. Dowie the greatest blessing God ever sent to Chicago, and I hope Chicago will appreciate it. <clears throat> and it says stenographically reported, but it was in fact a letter that was sent to the court. She was not present in court. That is where... She was a part of Dowie's act, and she probably was not any relation to Buffalo. Another piece um, is called The Novel Question of Law is Curing by Faith in the Case of John A. Dowie Genuine Statement of Witnesses. She, Sadie, swears that by some mysterious power her left leg was lengthened three inches and she was unable to walk without a limp. Her relatives verify her story. Miss Cody was carried into the home on a stretcher, taken from the train a helpless, doomed woman. The people of her Indiana town told her she would die among strangers. She came to the tabernacle in her extremity she asserts that all her physicians in the town had pronounced her marked for the grave and swears before a notary that Dr. C.A. David in State Street had declared her beyond the assistance of medical science. Conviction that she was to be instantly healed, reads the affidavit, came the moment she became a resident member of the singing, praying band. She so told Mr. Dowie. But he sent her to a room to spend a season with her Bible. Others were sent to bolster up her faith. Prayer lasted two days. And then the preacher concluded the time had come for the laying on of hands. Miss Cody was carried to the healing room and placed upon the sofa. Mr. Dowie listened to her confession of faith and then prayed. So did Miss Cody. Mr. Cody concluded his ministrations by command to arise and walk in the name of the Lord. Miss Cody describes in her affidavit that she felt within her some terrific force, some struggle, and arising stood upon her feet. She walked across the room the first time she had stood without assistance in a year. Within eight weeks, she says, she left the home a well woman. She came to Chicago from Morris, Illinois, to bear witness to the genuineness of the cures of Mr. Dowie. Now, apparently in this one, she actually comes to Illinois, but her testimony doesn't match at all, at all. And the one, she's in bed, she had just arrived, it, it, uh, one of his publications fell upon the bed and he came in and prayed and boom, she was healed. And the other, she worked for him for weeks. She worked for him for weeks. And uh, he had to have her confession of faith first. And she was singing in his choir. Um, let 
With, with these testimonies of Sadie in mind, we're set up much better to realize that there is truth in the claim that Sadie, Sadie Cody was healed by John Dowie or not. In this stenograph, Sadie made the statement that she received a copy of Leaves of Healing by Dowie before her healing at the 1893 World's Fair. The first editions of Leaves of Healing were not published until approximately six, month, six months after the end of the World's Fair in 1894. Thus, Sadie's already caught in her first lie. Or Dowie, if he is behind the fictional Sadie. In the next, we have a contradiction between the two testimonies. In the first, it was the same day she received the leaves of healing and her being brought to Chicago and Dowie praying for her and her instantly feeling better. However, in the next testimony of the court, she was first sent to a room for a season encouraged in the faith, sang in the choir, and then eventually Dowie got around to it. And what are the miraculous cures itself? She says, my limb was three inches short. The three inch short limb, is, it's a classic, con you know what, you were, I don't know if y'all are familiar with um, Todd White. Todd White claimed to heal leg. I think his was four inches, so he, he's greater than Dowie. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's silly. It's really silly. None of these faith healers ever, like, shorten one leg to make it the same length as the other. You notice that? Um, I'm not going to get into this magic show or how there's so many videos on YouTube that demonstrate how this leg growing trick is perform performed. You can look one of them up. Um, I, and when I did the layout that was supposed to be the book, I went into depth about it. I'm not gonna do that here. There's other things to move on to. From here, I just want to go into reading you some of the articles about some of the different people that died at his hands. Um, I think that's the next step. And from there, we might we might retrace back to some of his time in Australia. I'm not sure if I want to do that right now or not. But we're definitely going to cover a bunch of the deaths at his hands. That, that and the later con that he pulled on his own church, I think are perhaps the most significant issues. The, the succession, I guess you would, you could call it the succession of ministries that have come out of him are another important issue because many of the modern faith healers are descended from this movement. Their ministries are descended from a ministry, you know, they were taught by this person that was taught by that person. But unlike the Catholic Church, uh, and I hate to use that as an example, but unlike the Catholic Church, which keeps a list of successive bishops of Rome, even though I don't necessarily agree with who they say were the success were in the succession. These churches don't want to, they don't want you to know how this ministry came from that ministry and that one from that one and so on. But eventually, I'm going to get into all of that. But first, I'm focusing on the individual ministers and what they did. So I'm going to end this video. This is going to be the part one video. And then I'm going to start a second one, which will be the part two. And that will be where we start picking up on the articles regarding all of the deaths that Dowie caused. Well, not all of them. That's impossible. There were bodies they snuck away in the mist of night so that no one would know that the person was not healed. But the documented cases that we do know about that I have found so far, we're going to cover those in the next video. 
So for now, I wish you well, and I hope if you have the time, you'll go ahead and skip right net on and watch the next one as well. And this is probably my longest video ever, but all right, have a good day.